We all have one person in our lives who seems to never run out of energy. They wake up early, they get more done in a day than most of us do in a week. And they somehow manage to do so many things to a high standard without burning out. Now, I'm guessing someone just came to mind, right? Well, it's a lot easier to become that person than you might think. In this video, I'm going to give you seven realistic daily habits that I use as a normal busy person to boost my energy so I can wake up energized, be more productive and live a better life. Our first habit is to avoid a really common coffee mistake. If you wake yourself up each morning with a coffee, hi, this is for you. Coffee, of course, is a massive energy booster, but there are two common mistakes that most people make without even realizing it, and it's actually harming your energy, especially in the afternoon. Let's start with the most obvious one, consuming caffeine too late in the day. Coffee and energy drinks leave caffeine in our system for up to 12 hours after we drink them. Too much caffeine means that we either can't get to sleep or we don't experience the high quality sleep that we need. Sleep is the biggest foundation for strong energy levels so we have to get this right if we want to have more energy throughout the day. Avoiding caffeine in the 10 hours before bed will give your body enough time to clear out the rest of the caffeine and make sure that you can get to sleep and get a good quality sleep at night. The second mistake is drinking coffee too early especially first thing in the morning and before you click away I I promise I am trying to make your life better. Caffeine makes us energized by blocking our adenosine receptors. Adenosine is a hormone that makes us feel sleepy. It builds up during the day so that we can fall asleep at night and then as we sleep our body slowly clears it out of our system. However, when we wake up in the morning, almost always we still have a small amount of adenosine left in our system. Our bodies need a bit more time to clear this out. So when we have a coffee to wake us up very first thing in the morning, we disrupt this process. The adenosine can't clear out, it just gets silenced by the caffeine until eventually the caffeine wears off and that's when the afternoon slumps come in because there's no longer these caffeine molecules blocking the adenosine receptors, the adenosine just comes back in full force. So we can prevent this by delaying caffeine for 90 minutes in the morning. And I know that it sounds really hard. When I was first doing this, I made a few small changes that made it easier. Because I was in the habit of already getting coffee every morning, I stopped it for a decaf so I could still follow that same ritual. I also just replaced the caffeine with a cold water hit. And trust me, this is a pretty good substitute. I have done an entire video on improving your sleep and this goes into the concept of caffeine and your sleep a lot deeper so if you want to know more you can have a look at that video after this one every day when you wake up you get a choice you can take the easy route hit the snooze button tell yourself five more minutes roll over repeat five times eventually get up and rush out the door into the chaos of the day feeling completely unprepared and already behind for the day or you can take the hard route get up at your first alarm blind yourself with a bright light to force yourself to wake up now don't actually blind yourself please <laughs> grab your towel go to the bathroom don't let yourself think and get in the shower turn the tap to cold and stand there under the freezing cold water and let the magic happen. Let your body experience the adrenaline rush. Let your mind learn that you can cope with stressful situations. Let your breath bring you back to a state of control and calm. And walk out your front door that morning knowing that you can face the chaos of life because you've already put yourself into a hard situation and you've come out a better person. One single two minute cold shower every morning will immediately shift your baseline energy up to the next level. Level. I don't know a single person who takes cold showers and doesn't end up wide awake five seconds later and more importantly carrying a real sense of purpose throughout their day because turning that water to cold does something to your body and I want to explain the science behind it to give you more of an incentive to actually go and do it first cold water coming into direct contact with your skin sends electrical impulses and blood flow to your brain these immediately fire up your system and because cold cold water cools down your core body temperature, your body immediately starts working harder by pumping blood around your
your body to warm itself back up. This increased blood flow allows more oxygen and nutrients to be delivered to your brain. The result is that it reduces any grogginess left over from your previous night's sleep, especially if you wake up in the middle of a deep sleep phase. They also increase your alertness, mental clarity and energy, priming you for a morning of productivity and focus. The electrical impulses trigger the reliefs of endorphins, which are the neurotransmitters that we normally get from exercise, so you're effectively getting a runner's high without even having to do any running. The second thing that these cold showers do is they trigger the release of dopamine. Cold showers shift our nervous system into their sympathetic state, the fight or flight state. If you lived 10,000 years ago and were preparing to fight a tiger, think about how your body would respond to make sure that you could survive that encounter. You would would need to think, react and move faster, all the benefits that come from increased adrenaline. You would also need a massive boost in motivation, motivation to run or fight even if you didn't feel like it. This comes from the neurotransmitter dopamine. So cold showers cause an adrenaline rush and they also release dopamine. Together, this means that you walk out of that shower with more energy and more motivation, not just for the short term, but for the entire day. The third thing that cold showers do for us isn't to do with our body. It's to do with the change in our mental state. You cannot be someone who optionally puts themselves in an uncomfortable situation, who optionally chooses to stand under freezing cold water instead of a warm tap and doesn't walk out with the sense of internal satisfaction and drive. When you turn that tap to cold, you are sending your mind a subconscious message. You are telling yourself that you are capable of hard things, that you are willing to step outside your comfort zone and that you're strong enough to tolerate mental and physical discomfort. This means that the next time you face a stressful situation, you have the internal energy to be able to cope with it. These effects on your mind and body combined are why a single two minute habit can completely change the way the rest of your day plays out and over time the rest of your life. Always remember taking the easy route will lead to a hard day but taking the hard route will lead to an easy day and an easy life. If there is one habit I will die trying to convince the world to do it is this one. Go for a 20 to 30 minute morning energy walk. Please, if you are feeling tired or unenergized, if you are having trouble sleeping, if your mood feels low, I cannot explain just how much this will change the way that you feel every single day. When you leave your house and see sunlight in the morning, you create a healthy cortisol spike. You become more alert and your body clock regulates. When you're halfway through your walk listening to a podcast or playlist you love or just being present in the moment, you boost your dopamine. This dopamine spike, especially paired with a cold shower, massively increases increases your inner drive. And when you get home, having spent the last 20 minutes with your heart rate raised, your blood pumping and your lungs working, you are full of endorphins. You boost your mood, you increase your energy and these effects last. They carry through the entire day, meaning that you will have more motivation, less afternoon crashes and better sleep at night. Now, of course, we don't live in a perfect world. It's not always sunny and we don't always have the time. So here are a few solutions to the most common problems that I see people having. What if you wake up before the sun? Now, this is the problem that I am currently facing. I wake up at 5 a.m. and the sun doesn't come out until 7 a.m. at the moment. So if I'm at home, then I'll just use my LED light on my desk and then I'll go outside when the sun does come out. What if it's cloudy or raining? Now the average light intensity of an indoor light is 400 lux. The light intensity of my LED desk light is 900 lux. But the average light intensity outside on a cloudy day is 5,000 lux. Natural light will almost always be better than artificial light. So if you're able to get a 20 to 30 minute walk in, this will be more than enough to get what you need. I'll often use my LED light as a bit of an extra boost on cloudy days as well. And what if you don't have time? Now, I don't have parents that need caring for. I don't have crazy kids running around every morning that I have to get ready for school. If you can't get outside for a 20 minute walk, that that is okay, try just two minutes. On a really sunny day, this will pretty much give you everything that you need. And on the less sunny days, it's still better than nothing. Habit number four is to use micro triggers. Now, when we think of energy, most of us immediately go to physical energy, being able to do a workout or not falling asleep at our desks in the afternoon. What we don't think about is our mental and our emotional energy. We can do all of the workouts that we want, but if we are living in a state of negativity and we feel like the world is against us, 
we will never feel truly energized. The issue is generating a positive mental state can be really hard when you're busy. I have gone through the cycle of being so focused on ticking off to-dos and getting through meetings, working, then working out, then cooking and cleaning and doing everything else to keep your life going. We often don't even get a chance to think when this happens. So our subconscious mind runs the show most of the time. This means that if our subconscious mind is one of negativity, then our energy will almost always be lower than we want it to be. This is where something I like to call micro triggers come in. Micro triggers are small regular opportunities to control our thoughts and use our conscious mind. They're little reminders to enter the mental or emotional state that we want to be in and therefore boost our energy. Here's an example to show you what I mean. So I am training myself to use something called waiting triggers. This is a micro trigger that goes off in my head every time I'm waiting for something. It could be in line at the shops. It could even be just waiting for a tab to load or waiting for someone to answer the phone if I'm sitting on hold. I take a deep breath and ask myself one question. What can I be grateful for right now? I know it sounds like your classic self-help question, but really think about it. How many times a day do you have to wait for something? I would say at least five. So five times a day, you get the opportunity to switch your mind from worrying over something or being frustrated about waiting to recognizing just one thing that you're grateful for. Now, if you add these five times up per day over weeks or months, then eventually you are going to recondition your subconscious mind to look out for more things to be grateful for and be in a more positive state. Some other micro triggers could be every time you're about to get out of your car or each time you sit down at your desk. It could be before you enter your laptop password or even setting an alarm on your phone that goes off each hour and reminds you to think of this thing. And this doesn't have to be a gratitude practice. You could ask yourself, what level of energy am I at? You could remind yourself, this is an opportunity to make somebody's life better. There are limitless possibilities, but it is a guaranteed energy booster. Our fifth habit is to eat balanced meals. I had a friend who very nearly destroyed their new car the very same week that they got it. I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the world, but in Australia, we have different grades of petrol. We have 91, 95, and 98. Most older cars can run on any of them, but as my friend worked out, their new car could only run on the 95 or 98. Here's the thing, the car probably would have run on that lower grade fuel. If you fed it the 91 for its entire life, then you might not even realize that it's not performing how it should be. But the minute that you give it the fuel it needs, it's going to feel like you're driving a completely different car. Exactly the same thing goes for the fuel that we give ourselves. Now, I didn't have any idea about nutrition until I was about 19. Even with my type 1 diabetes, I knew basically nothing. I spent the first 18 years of my life eating whatever I wanted. But in a world that has normalized sugary cereal for breakfast and takeaway food for lunch, whatever I want wasn't exactly helping me. The types and amounts of food we eat impacts our satiety, our brain function, our blood sugar levels, and our hormones and neurotransmitters. All of these play a role in our physical and mental energy. And with so many voices and so much noise out there on social media, it can be really hard to even know where to start. So I want to make it simple. All you need to boost and maintain your energy is to include four different components in every meal. The first is protein. Eating protein keeps you fuller for longer, reduces your constant afternoon snacking, and it increases the level of neurotransmitters required for focus. This could include things like meat, fish, eggs, Greek yogurt, tofu, and beans. The second component is fat. Now your brain is made up of 60% fat. So eating healthy fats, things like avocado, fatty fish, olive oil, nuts and seeds, dark chocolate. They give our brains essential building blocks to enhance focus, memory, and learning. Fats are also the most efficient way to store energy, so they give our bodies a reliable source to pull from in between our meals. Component three is carbs. Now, carbs have been pretty demonized, but they are our brain's favorite source of energy. Having carbs that spike our blood sugar isn't really good for us, but having complex carbs, things like brown rice, 
oats, potato, quinoa, and whole grain bread. They give our brain a steady source of energy to function properly without all of the spikes and crashes. Protein, fats, and carbs are all macronutrients. And the final thing that we need is fiber for our micronutrients. Adding vegetables, fruits, and whole grains to your meals is a really great way to keep your hunger in check. It also balances your blood sugar and it's essential for a healthy gut, which is directly linked to a healthy brain. You honestly do not need to go on a low carb, low fat or dairy free diet to find the energy that you're lacking. You will eat 21 meals over the next seven days. If you can make 80% of them, 17 of those meals balance, you will realize just how much more you can do when you're giving your brain the 95 or 98 fuel it needs instead of making it suffer through with the 91. Habit Six is to stop overreacting. Taylor Swift has spent the last 12 months performing 83 three hour concerts in front of 80,000 plus people. She has extended her tour more than 11 times, adding new shows, new cities, even new countries. I love Taylor Swift, but even if you don't love her, you can't say that this isn't pretty impressive. Now imagine Taylor traveling between cities after each show. Imagine her in her private jet getting ready to back up her concerts night after tonight. What do you think she's doing? Do you think she's worried about those 80,000 people at her last show and what they thought of her? Do you think she's obsessing over the one wrong vocal note that she pulled? Do you think she's picking a fight with the flight attendant over the fact that they gave her a Diet Coke instead of a Coke Zero or that her takeoff was two minutes late? I can guarantee you that she isn't because if she was, she would not be 83 shows down in 12 months. Taylor Swift cannot afford to get caught up over every little thing. If you have seen any of her shows, you will know that she pours absolutely everything into them. She knows that's where her energy is most valuably spent and any extra energy, that's going to her family, her friends, her music, her hobbies, Travis Kelsey. So those hours and days that she has between shows would not be spent wasting energy on the small things. They would be spent protecting and generating her energy. Now, I want to be clear, I am not at all saying that you should push down your emotions. I'm not saying that you should be a ray of sunshine despite what life throws at you or that you should accept every single mistake that someone makes and not do anything about it. But just be selective. You have so many things going on in your life. Hundreds of things each day that if you let them will take little pieces of energy from you. Question which ones are actually worth your energy and which ones you will choose to let go of in favor of your family, your goals and your peace of mind. Habit seven is a concept that has completely changed my life and that is fine finding your personal recharge style. In the years after high school, I honestly believed that there was something wrong with me because while seemingly everyone else was out partying, I would be completely content in home, in bed on a Friday or Saturday night. What I'm about to explain made a massive difference at the start of my journey to overcoming these beliefs. You do not expect an iPhone to charge using an Android charger. And in the same way, you can't expect an introvert to recharge in the same way that an extrovert does. A lot of people mistake introversion and extroversion. People think that introverts are the shy, quiet ones, while extroverts are the loud ones who are the life of the party. How quiet or loud, shy or quiet you are has nothing to do with being an introvert or extrovert. In fact, about 70% of CEOs describe themselves as introverts. Introverts are simply people who generate more energy from being by themselves than they do with others, while extroverts are the opposite. If you don't know which one you are, then ask yourself this, what sounds better after a really long week? If it's an early night in bed with a book or a movie, maybe one other person, then you're probably an introvert. If it's a dinner with friends or a night out, then you're probably an extrovert. Knowing this can help you to find recharge activities that actually give you energy. So introverts will often recharge through quiet activities, things like reading, writing, cooking, nature walks, or listening to music. Many extroverts prefer things like volunteering, game nights, social events, going out for dinner, and group activities or sports. Now, don't put yourself into a box with this. You are not limited to just one list or the other. You're not just an introvert or just an extrovert. I would say I'm mostly an introvert, but I still play sports and go out for dinner with my friends. These activities are so important to me, but I just recognize that they don't really recharge me. If I went out for dinner, then I would then want to come home and spend time by myself 
yourself to generate more energy. Just remember that you can't pour from an empty cup, so knowing how to fill your cup goes a really long way. Now, we've just gone through seven habits, but where should you start? How can you put this into action? I am going to guide you through it. Here are your action steps for this video. First, review your energy. Everything that you do has to have a starting point. Knowing where you are right now will make it a lot easier to identify where you want to improve, track your progress, and look back and realize in a month's time how far you've come. So think about your current energy levels. Where have you got heaps of energy? Where are you currently lacking energy? And where do you need to focus on most? Remember, energy isn't just physical, it's mental and emotional as well. Action step two is to choose three habits. Go back through the seven habits that we spoke about and pick three things that you need to focus on the most right now. Yes, only three. If you do too many, then you won't do them. You can always come back to the other ones later. So just start by working out which ones will make the most positive impact on your life right now. Step three is to create an action plan. So you have your three habits. Now you need to implement some strategies to action them. How will you remember to do them? How will you stay consistent? How will you track them? And what challenges might come up and how can you overcome these? Action step four is to start and stick to it for four weeks. You won't see immediate changes, but if you can do this for four weeks, you will see such a difference in your energy and the way that you can live your life. Let me know which habits you've chosen in the comments below. I'll drop some more resources in the description that might help you with this journey as well. 